Okay, so we're going to hear from Hendrik now about citizens and satellites for global monitoring of natural waters. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is the one? Yeah. Sorry? Yeah. yeah just, and just to let you guys know, I'll give you a three-minute warning and a one-minute warning. Okay, yeah, I speak very slowly. So it's great to be here in Adelaide. It's quite a change in temperature after Amsterdam of zero degrees and now 40. It's kind of shock, so maybe I'm a bit incomprehensible, but it uh, must be the temperature. Okay, I'll tell you something about a, a nice project we've been doing in uh, Europe a number of years ago on trying to characterize the color of natural waters. So the title is a bit challenging, between citizens and satellites for global monitoring of natural waters. And my co-authors are located in the Netherlands, in Germany, and also here in Canberra, Janet. What I'd like to present to you is the uh, European CITLOS project. It did run for three years. And I'll tell you some highlights of what came out of that. Um, after that, I'll give some short introduction of the parameter we choose to measure natural waters, which is the color. Um, and from that, we derived an application, an app, that can detect the color of water. i move up this a little bit. So, yeah. Okay. Um, we have a fully operational website now and data collection called Iron Water. And I'll show you give you some demonstration of that. And finally, I'll show you how this can be integrated with satellite observations. So here we are, uh, CITLOPS. Um, it was one of five projects that was awarded by the European Commission to investigate what is the potential of citizen science. Uh, and we had a very broad topic, a number of topics in this uh, three-year project by, with, with people from Germany, Spain, Ireland, whatever. The um, main thing was the development of low-cost tools that everybody could use, prove the compatibility of in-situ data and remote sensing, so that was already a, a target from the start. Um, open access and data, everybody can access the data and upload the data, um, and also develop tools for different user groups. I've seen that already by a number of people who recognize that if you collect data, then the scientific use will be different from a water quality manager use or whatever, or the average citizen. Um, so it's a way to really to get people involved in monitoring their environment. And we try to do, get people involved in measuring their, the color of their, of their backyard water or coastal waters. So low cost optical tools. Um, you see four examples, that things that were developed, and you see the pyramid going from a big effort to really for citizen science, citizens to employ those instrumentation, that instrumentation, and it gets more and more narrow the more you go up. So what we did, for example, is a smart fluo instrument. Is, is there a pointer here? I don't know. No. It's, it's really at the bottom. So there you need 3D printing, um, um, you need a camera, you need some electronic development uh, skills to do it. It will only cost 300 Australian dollars, but still, it's still quite hard to make, so you really have to go for a high school or whatever. A bit better is the uh, Kaiduino, which is, um, well, you have the Arduino community. It's uh, hardware that can easily be combined, and there's a lot of things that are standardized there. And so there was a Spanish group who developed a simple way to make, measure the, the, the transparency. An even more simpler one is just taking photographs of bright disk in the water to say something about the transparency uh, for diving conditions. But finally, the thing that we mainly focused on was the water color. Um, and so that's simply to take a, a photograph and derive from that the color. So what is color? Well, color and citizen science, they come together already for a long time. Actually, there were people called Forel and Mr. Ulla they use a certain characterization of the color already for now 140 years. There are over 200,000 of observations collected by marine scientists or sailors or whatever. So this kind of citizen activity already existed already for more than a century. So what does happen is you use your eye as the, as the sensor and you compare uh, with the protocol. Below there on the right side you see 21 predefined colors, and you try to do a matchup of the color of the water with the 21 predefined colors, and you report it back. 
So a quite simple way to detect color. And you can quantify it, right? It's one of, out of 21. Now today we have more sophisticated tools. Um, so we go from the eye, you saw the upper left, you see the, trend, the typical um, uh, way that pe people can detect color. And we go now for taking photographs. If you saw, see here at the lower corner, you see a typical pho photograph that you can take with your smartphone. Uh, you see a lot of different things in this photograph, actually. You see the true color of the water, a quite a greenish brownish stuff, which is typical for the waters close to Amsterdam, but also see a lot of light reflection at the left side. So you have to do some processing, but it can be done. Um, we developed in the project, at least I developed in the project, an algorithm to detect that. I mean, this is what a typical citizen could take a picture and send, uh, send to the database. And from this, we have to derive the true color. Well, there are a number of things that uh, work out pretty well. We take a number of samples in the image itself, and from that can derive what is the true color of the water. Uh, expressed in so-called U-angle degrees, in the upper right, uh, you can see what we find with scientific instruments, 60.8 degrees, and from the image, we are very close, 60, 63 degrees. While the, the, the unit is not very important, the important thing is that from a very ordinary picture like this, we are able to derive the color of the water with very high accuracy. So that's good news. And indeed, we published this because we think it's essential that if you develop a new app, it must be accepted by a scientist. If it's not, then probably the water managers will have a problem there. They also always go for quality, right? So maybe you have an alternative way to measure a certain parameter, but you have to prove that it's reliable and at least characterize the uncertainties in it. So this was published. Good. And so we took this algorithm uh, in an application. It's called Ion Water. Um, it was developed by a number of partners that came out of this project and it's now fully operational. So you have to go to ionwater.org to download the app for iPhone or for um, um, uh, Android uh, systems. It works for 95% of the systems. There's always a small group of instruments that, um, that is not working. And what it does is um, you can take an image of the, of, of the good thing is that you can take an image of the, um, of the water with a certain protocol and you, you have to fill in a number of parameters, you send it down and after maybe one or two minutes you will see it appearing in the website of Ironwork. So you can immediately recognize your own observation with a certain quality assessment, which is nice, it's a goodie. So how does it work? You take an image of the water, following the app instructions, which are, well, you can skip the instruction, but the instruction is a really important part of the whole thing. Um, then you do the old-fashioned Fourel Ulle intercomparison, 21 predefined colors, to compare it with the image that you have taken, and that is sent together with some meta information like cloud condition or do you see the bottom, yes or no. It will be sent to the server. There it will be processed, quality, quality assessed, and it will give its own identification of the color from, from the image itself. So you have a kind of quality control. And so you see your observation directly uh, in the website. In the upper side there you see you can recognize your own observation if you want to. Um, and the lower part you see the kind of information that is available for every image. And for example, if you look at the right image over there, you can see there is a lot of grass. So maybe there's a chance that the software will think, well, this is extremely green. We have a huge algae bloom over there. Um, it's quite of strange. And to do, identify those more problematic um, uh, images, we have a flag there uh, below. It's in green. It's, it's really hard to, re to read right now. But you can flag it as, is there something wrong with this image? As soon as you flag it, it will be sent somewhere to the operator, and he will just get a list of um, potentially um, wrong images. So it's a very simple, efficient way to involve the public to identify wrong images. Okay, uh, this tool is available also for scientists. There are some more op options, like for example, you can also identify the transparency. You see here an image by somebody taken 
who already lowered the bright disk in the water, which is a quite standard way of deriving the transparency in the water. Uh, and so we also uh, still are developing uh, algorithms for that. Um, while here you see the whole structure. What I like to stress is that we have a lot of validation activities on the server um, and the data are stored in the National Archive because we think in the long run this kind of data should be available and stored similarly to all the oceanographic data that have already protocols and data, data storage facilities. So it's, it's, it shouldn't be citizen science apart from all the other observations. We think just by formatting the whole thing, we can integrate the whole stuff. So why combine with satellite data? Well, satellites are really almost superior in their coverage in time and spatial. And so you, here you see a typical part of the North Sea with the Netherlands in the South. Um, this is um, the kind of information that's available many, many times a week, right? So what we like to do is compare the color of citizens, the citizen observation with the color derived from satellites. Now, funny enough, there was no color project for satellites at all until three years ago. So we developed our own. We made two, of the, two publications on this. So now from almost every uh, visual satellite that there is, with um, spatial resolution between one kilometer and even 10 meters, we can make a color product. And we, so every pixel in there can be compared to your observation made with the app. And that's how we hope that we can integrate the whole thing. And maybe use, and Janet will talk about this, uh, use citizens to validate or uh, characterize the accuracy of the satellite product. Uh, we did a proof of concept in the Ebro Delta in Spain. You hear it's, it's near the south of Barcelona. It was done by the German and Spanish colleagues. Uh, we wrote an article again. It, again. And so what we did, we collected together um, the Pharrell ulic type of information, spectra, which are, are the, the basic tools for, for scientists, and satellite data. Oh, that's, that's more than enough. The article came out a year ago, and so what we try to do is to fill this triangle, to couple the triangle. You have, at the right side, you have the satellite observations. Normally, they have only a few points of intercomparison with really dedicated, very expensive scientific instrumentation. That's their validation, that's their characterization, that's how they develop algorithms. But what you like to do is be part of that loop. So our smartphone observations of color should be coupled not only to satellite observations, but also should be coupled to the standardized in situ measurements made by scientists. And that's, I think, the game we have to play for the next years. To, to, to tie in and to really be sure that set aside, set aside, citizen observations of color are compatible and can be used for satellites. That's the quality control. So, um, you may wonder what's the connection to Australia? Why am I here? Well, Janet will explain everything about this in the next talk. And please get started with the app. Thank you.